and welcome to Kentucky Science Center's first virtual Youth Science Summit. We're going to kick things off with our uh, com uh, opening remarks from our CEO, Mike Norman. Good morning. I'm Mike Norman, Chief Executive Officer of Kentucky Science Center, and I'm so excited to welcome you to our Youth Science Summit. Well, this is our first virtual Youth Science Summit. This is our 10th annual time together. We're so excited to present today a distinguished panel of STEAM professionals that you're gonna have the opportunity to hear from, hear their stories, learn all about their careers. We couldn't do this today without the generous support of our sponsors. So I want to thank Toyota, Lexmark, and ADP for all they do to support Youth Science Summit. So sit back, enjoy, and have a great morning. Thank you. Hi, my name is Melissa Blankenship, Director of Education at Kentucky Science Center. We're so glad to have you here with us this morning, and we have a great list of panelists for you guys to get to talk to today. First, I wanted to introduce Rebecca Sell. Rebecca, there you are, hello. Rebecca is the founder and executive director of Food Chain. Food Chain is a nonprofit organization located in the heart of Lexington, Kentucky. Food Chain creates a link between the community and fresh food through education and demonstration of sustainable food systems. I'm so happy to have Rebecca here with us today to share a little bit about her organization and their community efforts. Thank you. Well, thanks so much for having me. It's uh, exciting to be um, a part of this group, um, even in a, a virtual format. So um, I, I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, I, in, in thinking about how I um, wanted to talk today, um, I thought it would be helpful a little bit to discuss kind of what led me to this path. Um, so I'm a native Lexingtonian. Um, I grew up in downtown Lexington um, and attended a mixture of private and public schools all throughout um, and ended up in uh, the math and science program here in Lexington at Dunbar High School. Um, and while my career, I think, has been a very crooked path in terms of how I um, have uh, stepped into some different roles along the way, uh, there's definitely been an underpinning of a love and appreciation for science and for education that has threaded throughout. Um, so from uh, my high school, I then went on to MIT um, in Cambridge up north. Um, and one of the things that attracted me to MIT was that I really felt divided between kind of on an artistic side and a um, creative path as well as sciences, which I truly loved. And so MIT had both a strong architecture program as well as a chemistry program, which is what I ended, ended up studying. Um, what's interesting is that while my degree is in architecture, I have not practiced architecture at all. Um, uh, but I think the underpinnings of kind of that systems thinking that science has provided for me, uh, as well as the creative angle of application of those sciences, while it hasn't um, uh, linearly led to my path in life, those, um, that kind of uh, problem solving and creative thinking certainly has um, led to a lot of the different steps that I have pursued along the way. So after um, graduating with my degree in architecture, I actually went straight into teaching. So I taught chemistry and physics at the high school level for several years, and then ultimately found my, myself in um, a Montessori classroom setting. Um, and uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Montessori, a lot of it is about independent learning um, and finding the joy in learning new things and create um, curiosity. Uh, and while I was teaching at the middle school level is when I realized um, how much food was a part of um, education. So I grew up in a household that certainly valued um, food. My mom had a little garden in the backyard. We ate dinner together every day. And while, you know, if you had asked me in high school, School, whether that was something that I thought I was going to pursue. Um, I certainly didn't have that as a career track, uh, but it was, it was really part of the foundation of, you know, the great pleasures in life. And it was from my um, experience as becoming a land instructor at the Montessori Middle School um, that I realized that not only was food a great motivator, particularly when you're working with adolescents, although truthfully, every age group um, is motivated by food. It's also just a really fantastic way of bringing people into the study of science. 
Um, so for example, when you're looking at growing food, you know, the soil science that comes into play, the soil chemistry, the environmental sciences, the, you know, the physics that's involved with um, uh, all the different water pressure within plants and animals. So there's just a lot of inherent science that's built into it. And while I, I loved teaching in the classroom, what I ultimately realized was is that I felt compelled to get education and particularly creative non-traditional education um, to a broader audience um, outside of the private school setting. So I left the um, school world in 2008 and segued into the nonprofit world. And at first I became an education director at a um, nonprofit called Seedleaf that was working to teach kids about community gardening and really to, to think, focus more on agriculture. But then ultimately in 2012, I went out on my own. And that's when I founded Food Chain. So Food Chain, like uh, Melissa was saying in the introduction, is a nonprofit we're specific to Lexington. And our mission is to forge connections between community and fresh food. We use education and demonstration as the tool to do that. So we're really trying to inspire people to think about food in a new way, but there's definitely a strong social bent to that and a social justice bent to that. And part of that had to do with where Food Chain got founded and where we operate out of. So I'm not sure how many of the attendees today are from Central Kentucky. Um, under normal non-COVID times, we do a lot of field trips through our facility. And that's one of the best ways, I think, of really learning about what Food Chain is doing and why we're doing it. Um, because the place is very, very important to what we're, how we're operating. But we're, we're located in an old bread factory in downtown Lexington. So historically, um, there was a rainbow bread factory. Actually, before it was a rainbow bread factory, it was a little small family-owned um, factory uh, uh, bakery all the way back in the 1870s is when it was formed. And over time, it became larger and larger and larger. It became a corporate um, operation. It's a 90,000 square foot uh, bread factory that finally shuttered its doors in the 1980s. And what's fascinating about it is, um, number one, that's a big food facility. Um, so big that in fact, there's a rail line that goes along the back of the building. It's no longer functional, but at the time they would bring in entire rail cars of grain that they could mill on site to then turn into bread. So there's a lot of, a lot of food coming out of this building, but it was also a big employer in the neighborhood. Um, and it's located on 6th Street, which um, is very close to the kind of heart of downtown. But all around this building, this industrial zoned building are residences. Um, and in many cases, those residents, residential neighborhoods grew up around employment opportunities in the building. But they also, in some cases, predated that um, bakery. So uh, there's a settlement of what was at the time a settlement of freed slaves after the turn of the Civil War. Um, there's Section 8 apartments from the 70s. Uh, it's very, very diverse around there, but it's all residential family based. And what's critical about it is you had this um, abandoned food facility sitting in the middle of this residential neighborhood, but that residential neighborhood is a food desert. So what that means, it's a USDA designation. So the federal government actually um, scans the, the country and identifies where there are places with high concentrations of poverty. So a lot of people living below the poverty line, but at the same time, more than a mile away from the grocery store. And the reason that's so significant, it's, it's you know, food des desert is a little bit of a confusing term because people think, well, there's no food available. We share a wall with a restaurant. Um, there's definitely food available in the neighborhood. But the, the reason they're specifically measuring to a grocery store is because the grocery store is where we typically rely on for getting our fresh ingredients. And you all might have caught when I, when I mentioned Food Chain's mission, we always try to use the adjective of fresh. We're not dietitians, we're not nutritionists, we're not in the business of telling people that you know there's bad food, there's good food, but by and large, the more fresh food you eat, and in a grocery store, that's the perimeter of the grocery store, um, it tends to be better across the board. You know, It tends to be better for our bodies, it tends to be better for the planet. Um, and from a food system standpoint, there's more people involved in that. Um, and doing this work here in Central Kentucky was certainly important because we are an agrarian state. Um, and even though I'm a native Lexingtonian and I grew up in the heart of the city, I don't have any agricultural background. I can recognize as someone who enjoys eating and enjoys cooking, 
that I'm dependent on someone to grow that food initially. So with Food Chain's mission of doing this work specifically in a food desert, in a former bread factory, there was an opportunity to kind of turn the model on its head. So to inspire visitors and inspire um, students who might come through our facility of to think about food in a new way. It's not just something you shove in your mouth between classes or you know because you're bored, but what, what has gone into that food? Not only the science in that, but also all the people. Um, and so Food Chain is really trying to model a local innovative food system. So to that end, when we started with this really big mission back in 2012, we said, well, you can't eat fresh food, you can't prepare fresh food, you can't access fresh food if, if someone doesn't first grow it. So we began with a farm. Now we are an indoor farm, which is pretty non-traditional to begin with, uh, but we're also in an urban setting. So we're a, we're a very, very niche um, uh, model in that. But the important thing around that is that by doing that type of uh, very different farming, we're also showing that agriculture doesn't have to be delegated simply to traditional rural acreage um, production. But instead, if we kind of change our model of all different ways of how we can grow food, we can make a lot more land agriculturally productive. And we can involve a lot more people in that production. So we can, we can have farmers who look different and we can raise up the farmers who are currently operating. We can also create it as a new career track, even for younger people or people who you know don't have a desire to go live in the country per se. So to do indoor urban farming, you, you can't just you know grow traditionally in the same way that conventional farming has had to do. And so we had to focus in on aquaponics. So the kind of farming that we're doing, um, we are raising both plants and fish in a recirculating system. And that's what aquaponics really is. We have a 7,000 gallon system, takes up about 2,500 square feet. And we're actually in the former oven room of that bread factory building, uh, which works really well for us because we need to control our environment very carefully. And one of the great things about agriculture is that it is it can be a very high tech industry. Um, here in the state of Kentucky, we've got some pretty exciting things happening in tech and agriculture um, across the state. Uh, but uh, food chain is a much smaller scale than maybe some of the enormous hydroponic operations happening. Um, but aquaponics is great because it it brings in animal husbandry with fish as well as plants. So it, it really touches in upon enormous variety of, of the sciences. Uh, and that's an important part for us as we bring in field trips and school groups um, under normal conditions of trying to connect together what they might have learned you know, in a lab or in a textbook and show like this is its real application in the real world. Um, so we, the other, by being indoors, we have no seasons to contend with. So it's a great way of, again, modeling a different way of doing agriculture that isn't so reliant on whether we're in more control of our environment and it can produce food year round. So going back to the idea that part of our inspiration was around these areas with limited access, the fact that winter doesn't mean a different production schedule for us than summer is again, another opportunity for us to hook in interest, to capture people's imagination and hopefully to inspire replication, which is a really big goal of ours. You know, We are not trying to feed all of Lexington or all of central Kentucky or certainly all of the Atlantic seaboard, um, but we are trying to you know, be transparent of showing these techniques and encouraging other people to consider how they could get involved and in best case scenario, you know, inspire more people to do this so that we have more food being grown so that we can get more fresh food accessible to all. Um, so the farm is really where things started. Um, we do harvest our fish and our, our plants. We grow tilapia and lettuces and dark leafy greens and a lot of microgreens. And I mentioned that we share a wall with a restaurant. That what restaurant is Smithtown Seafood. And while we don't own that restaurant, we partner very intentionally with them. Because from the, from the restaurant standpoint, from the consumption and the preparation standpoint, um, you need access to fresh ingredients. And traditionally, you know, you're buying those from a broadline distributor, or maybe you're, you know, really committed to local farmed goods and you're buying them from a directly from a farmer from a, a farmer's market. But because outdoor products shift seasonally, it puts a lot of challenges on restaurants or home consumers who might, you know, want to be buying local of how do they shift their um, 
their consumption based upon the seasons. So the fact that we could share a wall with a restaurant and they very heavily feature salads on their menu, they don't have to find a different producer in the winter time for their lettuce because we're growing lettuce year round. So it served them to have a farm, particularly an aquaponic farm directly in their backyard. And it serves us from a marketing standpoint to have one of our main buyers right on the other side of that door. And I think I should mention too, that while you know all the science and the um, social justice and the um, innovation is really important, all of these things depend on economics as well. Right. Um, you, you have to have some sort of a sustainable economic model in that. And Food Chain is a nonprofit, which means we do apply for grants. We get donations. We have uh, fundraisers. We do events, all of those traditional nonprofit things. But it's also really important for us to have some portion of our costs that we actually generate our own revenue. So the farm is a way to do that. Um, so we sell our products and we don't just give them away, but it's an opportunity for us to model an, a sustainable um, economic system as well as a sustainable um, food system. Um, so we we operated our farm for the first uh, four years. And then basically um, at a certain point we realized there's only so much raw food one can eat. Um, sooner or later, you're gonna need to be cooking your food and possibly putting up your food, processing your food. So in 2017, we opened in the same bread factory, but in the next bay, our second um, infrastructure. So we have our farm that came first and then moving up the food system is then our teaching and processing kitchen. And by the name, um, our, our kitchen allows us to teach a lot of students and adults, particularly during non-COVID times, about how to prepare um, meals and snacks and menus utilizing fresh ingredients. Um, and then the back half of the kitchen, the more commercial side, allows us to put up um, that surplus. So because we have a lot of ties to local farmers, we know that when food comes in during harvest season, and this is a great time of year when there's just a real bounty of product, um, it's very perishable. So in lieu of just gorging yourself on squash, how to make it last is to process it. Um, so our processing kitchen allows us to connect with farmers to primarily to dry and freeze surplus and seconds um, of locally grown product. And by putting it up, making it last longer and making it more convenient, hopefully we can spread out that product so that again, people can be accessing fresh, I'll put that in quotes because it's not necessarily fresh off the vine, but it's grown locally and then we've preserved it in a way that hopefully retains most of its vitamins and minerals. So you can eat that um, non heavily processed um, food and access it even in even in cooler times of the year. So at every different facet food chain is trying to roll in education. Um, there's a lot of opportunities for people to plug in with the food system, even if it means just thinking more about what you're putting in your mouth but also in terms of career paths. Um, we do a lot of workforce development, both with helping kids think about um, different job opportunities, but also adults. Um, a food system has a lot of different people that are plugged into it. So it's a really great um, opportunity to think about getting involved from a vocational path and certainly from just how you, you know, a life skill of being able to, you know, cook for yourself, cook for your family and access um, local fresh ingredients. So that's the work that I get to do with Food Chain. Um, there's a lot of different pieces during normal times. We really love having a lot of volunteers um, with social distancing requirements. There's not a lot that we're able to do in terms of people coming into our facility, but we've tried to bring our work outside of our walls. So we're doing a lot of virtual education as well as trying to provide as much access to wholesome uh, scratch made food as possible during these times. Rebecca, thank you so much. I do, I have one question that someone has sent in. And um, just to let everybody know, we have disabled the chat function, but you are able to submit your questions through Q&A. And you know, Rebecca, I think it's so important for, you know, events like this, we want to show uh, our teens and our adults, you know, our, our young children, like what are the different careers that are out there in those STEM fields? And so often you don't, uh, you know, you think of your, your general degrees, your engineers, your doctors, your, you know, things like that. But to think about being able to take something that you're passionate about that community advocacy piece and then being able to tie the science into it and these life skills. I think that's fantastic. All right, let's see. Uh, Josie Gallo has asked, how much more does aquaponics yield and how much soil is saved? 
So aquaponics is a very intensive way of farming um, because your, your crops aren't spread out as much. Um, it's, it's hard to say, um, you know, uh, because yield is so crop dependent. Um, it's not a real good um, apples to apples comparison. But in terms of saving, um, one of the biggest saving points of aquaponics is actually in water consumption. Um, typically in conventional farming, you know, one of the one of the biggest um, resources that's consumed is water, um, primarily because you're putting water down on your fields and most of that water is actually going into the water table. So it's only that water that those plant roots can take up as quickly as possible. But in aquaponics, you don't have a water table. In fact, that water is constantly cycling around. Plus, you don't have um, as much water loss because it's indoors. So much of the water loss that would be done from a, uh, that would be attributed to evaporation and transpiration is actually recaptured because we have a, dehum or a, um, a dehumidifier running, basically a little cloud system. So we use about 5% of the water compared to conventional agriculture. So it's an incredible conservation. And in fact, Aquaponics is one of these techniques that has been used primarily in third world countries where they're used to conserving resources in a way that um, more developed nations aren't aren't necessarily as prone to now more and more with um, you know the the planetary concerns of resource consumption aquaponics is now leading into areas that um, typically have more resources as they think about how to best conserve the remaining resources that we have. Um, so it is a, it's an incredibly resource conserving uh, method, although it does have to be place based. Excellent. All right, Rebecca, thank you so much for joining us again this morning. Um, we will have the opportunity to um, again share this video later and then anybody that does have additional questions feel free to fill them in with a Q&A and we can always go back and actually ask our presenters and email those questions out. All right, thank you, Rebecca. Have a great day. Thanks so much, you guys too. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to Veronica and she's going to introduce Dr. Natasha Desjardins. Thank you so much, Rebecca, that was fascinating. Um, yes, I am uh, Veronica here at the Science Center and I, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Uh, Natasha Desjardins. She is the, pardon, no, the Interim Associate Director of Program and Partnership Development at the National Environmental Health, Health Association. So she is uh, leads research as well as climate and health activities. She's a graduate of the University of Louisville right here in Louisville, Kentucky, where she completed her PhD in Masters of Public Health, both concentrating in environmental health sciences. It is a pleasure to meet you. Thank you so much. I am so glad to be here. I'm going to launch my slides now and I greatly appreciate your very kind introduction. Bear with me just a moment. It takes a little while to power up. My slides are, are large, <laughs> but that doesn't mean I'm going to try not to take up much of your time and leave some time for question and answer. So once again, thank you so much for the kind invitation. It's a wonderful honor to be here. You can see through um, my background, I am from Kentucky. I'm from Georgetown, Kentucky, went to uh, all of my college in Kentucky. So you can see that from my background here. Of course, I'm at the National Environmental Health Association now, which I'll tell you more about. And then I also teach at George Washington University. So climate change, I'm going to delve into climate change um, and how the how it harms children's health in particular in the later slides. But first, I'd like to tell you just a little bit about the National Environmental Health Association. Our mission is to advance the environmental health professional for the purpose of providing healthful environments for all. So who are environmental health professionals? Well, we make up the largest segment or the second largest segment of the public health workforce, second only to nursing. And what we do is we ensure that communities have clean air to breathe, safe water to drink, safe food to eat, and are in environments that are free of mosquitoes and other disease carrying vectors. We have nearly 7,000 members who largely work at state and local health departments, but also work in the federal uh, services, as well as people that work at universities and industry. We have a long and successful history of providing education and training, as well as being a resource for the environmental health community. And much of the work of our members is in areas that's both directly and indirectly related to climate change. 
So I just wanted to share with you a snapshot of climate and health at NEHA in government affairs. We've advocated for funding to support climate related activities, um, as well as work to include environmental health in um, an act, the Pandemic and All Hazards Preparedness Act, that's very much connected to climate change and emergency preparedness. In addition, we provided support for state and local health departments, including the Minnesota State Department of Health and a tri-county region in Oregon to help build capacity for their climate activities. Um, in addition, we do a lot of work to inform policy. Informing policy, that's little p policy, so it's largely educating and getting the information out. From that, I really want to highlight to you something that our organization is very excited about. Two years ago, our board unanimously um, declared that by 2030, NEHA will be 100% clean energy. We also have a very active member group engaged on climate. There's a program committee that's dedicated to it and has even written our climate change policy statement. Oh, went a little too fast. Uh, so what I want to point out as I um, orient us to children being, um, how children's health is related to climate change, I want to point out how children are uniquely vulnerable to um, all environmental exposures. And this is because they still have developing organ systems um, up until adulthood. They breathe in more air and take in more water for their size compared to adults. So this means that children are more exposed uh, as a whole. Um, in addition, Children are dependent on adults to make decisions for their well being and for their safety. Children also, especially when you consider small children like babies and infants, um, they have unique behaviors that leave them more exposed. They're crawling on the ground. They also, you, you've seen them with the oral exploratory habits. They find something, they put it in their mouth. Um, so this can lead to them ingesting hazards. And then they're shorter, they're closer to the ground. So um, this leaves them closer to ground level pollutants. So in many ways, children are more exposed. And then that is an added burden because their organ systems are still developing and exposure at the wrong stages of development can be particularly harmful to their health in the short or long term. Uh, changing gears from broad environmental health to climate change, the World, Organiza World Health Organization estimates that 88% of the global burden of climate change falls on children younger than five years old. This is a stark statistic to me. It's um, heartbreaking, but also inspiring. We have work to do. This is a generational injustice that, that such a large burden of this falls on. Uh, a group that's not contributing to climate change. They're not driving. They're, you know, they're, they're not putting these pollutants into the air. Those are, um, you know, more related to adults. So this is absolutely a generational justice issue. And I'll try to frame it as such as I speak. I want to celebrate the youth movement on climate. I had the great honor to be invited to speak at the um, Schools for Climate Action Youth Advocacy Summit, which took place on Capitol Hill last year. These students, um, there were hundreds of them, and they met with their Congress people and senators to um, ask for action on climate to protect children's health and well being. Uh, so, being a panelist, I actually snapped the photo of the audience as I was on the panel. I was so struck by how many youth were there. And you can see the youth are there towards the front. The staffers that, that you know, the um, panel is speaking to are all at the back of the room and around the side. So it's really exciting to, it's so exciting to see youth raise their voice on this issue. And, and I'm grateful to, to give life to voice, the voices of youth when I have the opportunity. So how did I get here? Um, I've been recently asked what led me on this path and it goes back to my childhood. I am a child of the Great Migration. So this means that my parents grew up in the Jim Crow South um, of Birmingham, Alabama and moved to points north to find opportunity. So as I said, I grew up here in Kentucky um, but the people of the Great Migration would work very hard to keep strong connections with the family back down south. And so calling and visiting as often as they could. And this meant that I spent a lot of my summers 
and um, other breaks through school in Birmingham, Alabama. And it was the best of times. I was with my grandparents. I got to play with my cousins and you can see them here in these pictures. Uh, if you're wondering who I am, I'm the child that's not looking at the camera in either photo. Uh, one I have on a blue tie and the other one I have on a red plaid dress. But it, we just had so much fun running, playing with not a care in the world. But actually I did have a care. I noticed at an early age that when I would visit Birmingham, my asthma that was very well controlled in Kentucky would always flare up when I would visit to the point where I started to have to pack extra medication um, just in case when I would visit. So fast forward to grad school, I got into grad school and had the opportunity to do a community health assessment in any community in the US. I selected the North Birmingham community because it always lingered with me. Why can I not breathe as well when I'm there? Well, what I found was that the community where my parents grew up, that's home to my grandparents, was home to numerous hazardous facilities. And so when my grandparents purchased their home, housing options were subject to redlining. So that meant that they didn't necessarily have a choice where they lived and their community was home to a lot of steel industry plants. So the air quality wasn't good as they grew up and they continue to grapple with that now. So what I also found was that the community was home to numerous health disparities. Um, present day, um, uh, heart disease and diabetes and even low birth weight for children. So the long and short, what I found out was that the place where I, where my family was raised was home to numerous environmental injustices. And this changed the trajectory of the direction I wanted to go with my career. This let me know that um, it is my responsibility to be a voice for the voiceless, um, to call out um, injustices, and to continue to fight to protect health. Um, my thought is a little bit different now. So not only to be a voice for the voice, voiceless, but to give voice, to make a seat at the table for people to be able to call attention to what they're facing. So with that, I'll step just a little bit into the unique ways that climate change harms children's health. So we'll start with air quality. We all deserve clean air to breathe, but climate change is changing the, or decreasing the quality of the air that we breathe. So we have higher carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere, and this is trapping heat and pollutants below, much like a blanket traps heat. So the extra trapped heat decreases our air quality by increasing air pollution. And also we have um, more extreme heat, longer, hotter, warm seasons. Um, heat also is bad for air quality. And then think about what our friends out west are experiencing right now when it comes to wildfires. Uh, the smoke from the wildfires is, is very bad for air quality as well. And then something that I didn't know before I came in the field is that we've got these longer, hotter, warm seasons. That is also linked with a longer and more intense pollen season, which is bad news for allergy sufferers. And then also we have more frequent floods and that leaves behind, that can leave behind mold in our homes and schools and workplaces. And mold is another allergen that decreases air quality. So um, in terms of how this impacts health, especially for children, this increases risk of asthma or hospitalization for asthma. It also increases allergies as I've pointed out. And this these are not just um, nuisances. These actually can cause school absences or decrease productivity in school. And it's really important for ultimate long-term health outcomes for our students to be in school. So um, I'm going to trans. I'm going to transition and share with you uh, some things that the environmental health workforce are doing. Um, adaptation is how we can address um, the current way that we're experiencing climate change, so how we adapt to the current conditions. And I want to share with you a great study out of University of Louisville. My colleagues there have partnered with the Nature Conservancy 
for the Green Heart Study. And they looked at the relationship of heart disease and air pollution, and then planted trees, and then looked at air pollution and heart disease after planting those trees. And it's a really exciting study. And it's really something exciting to be able to showcase to other cities. This is something other cities can do um, because trees can decrease air pollution and green space is associated with better health outcomes. Other things that we do in the environmental health workforce, we test the air, we also issue and disseminate, uh, disseminate alerts. So not just issuing them, but making sure all people can receive these alerts and then also enforcing any air quality regulations. So changing gears to extreme heat. Uh, extreme heat is the top cause of natural weather related death in the US. And climate change is increasing the frequency and intensity of these extreme heat events, making it very concerning. So how is this related to health? We have heat-related illness. Um, that can be heat exhaustion, or it can be heat stroke. And heat stroke is important to pay attention to because if not tended to very quickly, heat stroke can actually be deadly. Um, uh, as I shared before, extreme heat is also related to respiratory diseases. So you'll have more asthma, for example, during that time of extreme heat. So uh, the consequences can be um, severe on children's health. And in terms of what people are doing across the globe, there are many um, both hot and dry climates across the world. And what they're doing is similar to what I shared with you um, that University of Louisville is doing. There are places that are planting trees. There are places across the world that are increasing green spaces as a way to combat. Then there are some urban planning activities where um, you, you've probably very familiar with traditional roofs that are gray or that are black. Um, those actually absorb the sun's heat. So in some places they're making um, those roofs more reflective of the sun's heat and making them white or lighter colored uh, to be able to reflect. So um, there are lots of things that are taking place to adapt to extreme heat. Other things that we're doing in the workforce, we educate, we educate physicians, we educate communities um, about the health threats. We also ensure issuing these alerts when there's extreme heat alerts or heat waves, and then cooling centers. These are places where people can go and cool off. Not everyone has access to air conditioning, but air conditioning is the number one way to prevent heat-related illness. So ensuring that people have access to a con air conditioned space where they can cool off or a splash pad or something where they can go and get some reprieve from the heat. In addition, I'm gonna change gears to extreme weather. Increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is increasing surface water temperatures. So it's not just the air temperatures, but it's also the temperatures of the waters that are increasing. And so this makes uh, the frequency and intensity of extreme weather events um, more frequent and more extreme. So we you know we're talking about this right now and we're you know there are places of the US that are experiencing this right now with the recent hurricane Laura um, Beta and Sandy that have made um, landfall along our coast. Uh, these photos here are from Hurricane Harvey. As you know, 2017 was a record-breaking year for hurricanes in the U.S. with Harvey, Irma, and Maria all making landfall here. Um, these images from Hurricane Harvey show some of the youngest victims, and I wanted to call them to your attention. This goes back to my point of children being dependent on adults to make decisions for their health and well-being. But what I also wanted to point out to you is um, the mental distress that we can pick up on in these pictures. And extreme weather is not just associated with physical threats to health, but also mental health um, can be burdened by extreme weather, and especially for children. The storms may produce anxiety and stress for children. And then after the storms, children may um, report PTSD or even depression. So what, uh, sorry with these slides. So what are the members of the environmental health workforce doing? Well, we're certainly working to ensure um, access to evacuation. What has been found is that the sooner and further one evacuates from the site of the storm, the better their health outcomes are ultimately. So not just having an evacuation plan, but ensuring that everyone will be able to access this and be able to evacuate safely. 
I will say this is a challenge in COVID because going to storm shelters in a time where we need social distancing to mitigate a pandemic is challenging. And they had to grapple with that with Hurricane Laura and the, um, and the other named storms this year. So another way that climate change can harm health is through extreme precipitation in the form of either rainfall or drought. Uh, so with flooding, this can harm health because floods can actually overflow our sewer systems and put untreated water into our drinking water supply. So this can increase our risk of gastrointestinal illness. There's a study that found that uh, around half of um, waterborne disease outbreaks were preceded by an extreme rainfall event. Also, the flooding can um, be destructive to our communities. It can wash our roads away, which can also be a barrier from us getting the medical services when we need it. In addition, um, the other extreme side of precipitation is drought. And with drought, uh, we were just speaking about agriculture. Drought can decrease crop yield. And globally, we're seeing malnutrition associated with this. In addition, drought condi produces conditions that are conducive to wildfires. Um, and the smoke from wildfires can be linked with asthma, as I pointed out before. So what is the workforce doing? The workforce will work with um, people in agriculture and advocate for climate smart practices. We'll educate around crop diversification and soil and water conservation. Um, in addition, we test water quality um, in, in the name of, uh, you know, a um, water breach. Uh, we also test soil quality and certainly issue water advisories and work to ensure that all receive this. So my grandmother that doesn't get text messages still knows that there is a water advisory in her area. Uh, and lastly, I wanted to touch on vector-borne diseases. So climate change is changing the amount of mosquitoes and ticks and also changing how they're distributed across the US. So places that did not once have ticks, for example, or certainly not in an abundance, have many ticks now. Um, so Lyme disease is on the rise. And we look at Maine, um, when I started presenting about climate change about five years ago, uh, maybe 20 years before that, the report was that um, in Maine, there were about a dozen cases of Lyme disease total. Uh, as of just a couple of years ago, there were over 600 cases of Lyme disease. So this is absolutely increasing. Similarly, West Nile is increasing and changing its geographic distribution across the US now able to, um, uh, the mosquitoes that carry West Nile are able to inhabit areas that once were not conducive. And then we have Zika virus and Zika is particularly concerning when it comes to children's health because of how it can affect pregnant moms and their babies. So what do we do about vector-borne disease? Uh, we work to educate about it. Uh, there's a group in Maine, um, as I said, Lyme disease is um, becoming more prevalent there. There's a uh, environmental health professionals there in Maine that are working to educate physicians that there's an increase in this and um, what to tell their patients and how to prepare their patients and um, ensuring that People know to wear clothes that cover their skin in the summertime, but are you know still loose fitting, uh, so that people can be cool. Um, in addition, wearing insect repellent, so helping educate about those things. Vector control is a very predominant area of the environmental health workforce, and some of it is prevention. It's looking to see what areas attract bugs. And so um, here I've got two images of standing water. One is in someone's yard and they've got a tire. Um, and so making sure people know to be careful about things like this because this will attract bugs, um, insects and ticks. And then also you see this may be the result of flooding. So the workforce needs to be aware of these repeated areas that have standing waters and be um, prepared to reduce uh, those types of areas. Um, so I wanted to highlight vulnerable populations um, and populations that are more susceptible. We're all at risk to the health threats of climate change, but there are 
some groups where climate change actually acts as a threat multiplier for them. I've pointed this out for children and given you evidence throughout. So I'll share with you just a little bit about the other additional populations. The elderly, they're more likely to be socially isolated. They're more likely to have other health conditions that make them more susceptible. Impoverished communities, these communities um, may not have the resources to be able to bounce back quickly when there's a hurricane, for example. Communities of color are more likely to be on the fence line of polluters, leaving them more exposed and also having more health disparities. Indigenous communities have strong ties to the land and these strong cultural and religious ties are being affected. Um, their populations are being displaced or they're not able to pass on these traditions to the next generation because of how the land has been affected. We also have people with a disability um, that may not be as easily able to relocate in times of extreme weather. Undocumented residents may not feel comfortable going to a shelter, even though it would help protect their health, um, they may fear deportation or otherwise. And then we have LGBTQ populations who also may not feel comfortable in storm shelters for fear of discrimination or worse. So there are several populations that bear a heavier burden and also climate change acts as a threat multiplier. So when we think about solutions, we have to make sure that the most vulnerable among us will benefit um, and are at the center of action. Uh, lastly, as I pointed out, it's not just physical health, it's mental health as well. So exposure to increased weather, um, extreme weather and floods can increase stress, anxiety, PTSD and depression. Nearly half, 49% of Hurricane Katrina survivors developed a mood or anxiety disorder. Also in Hurricane Katrina, one in six developed PTSD. Uh, so especially when it comes to extreme weather, we're quite susceptible, but even extreme heat can cause our medications to be inactive at certain temperatures. So these are things to keep in mind uh, as it's not just the physical health impacts, it's also the mental health. And lastly, I wanted to share with you um, a story behind this photo. So I worked at the American Public Health Association and we were preparing to host the 2017 Year of Climate Change and Health. Um, and leading up to it, it became concerning that, uh, that the topic may be polarizing and is this the right time to do this? And we had to pause and reflect. And I'll never forget our executive director. Um, he said, when it comes to public health, it is always the right time to do what's right. So we move forward with the year of climate change and health following those wise words of Dr. Georges Benjamin, who was quoting Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. Um, and it was wonderful. We had over 60 partners to join in. We were really able to gain a groundswell that we're speaking about climate change as a health issue and making that connection. And, uh, and one of the ex most exciting events is shown here in this picture. We actually um, hosted a meeting in partnership with Vice President Al Gore, one of the best uh, days of my career. And, uh, but, but the whole year just um, reflecting on that it's always the right time to do what's right. So I hope that you will take that as you move forward with how, how you all will be saving the world because we're depending on you. So thank you so much. Um, I'll share with you my contact information if that's helpful at all. And I've greatly appreciated your time today. Thank you so much. This has been very helpful and it's very important to be hearing about these things all always. So we do have some quick questions and we do encourage other ones to ask questions. Again, if we don't get it to them right now, we can always reach out later. So the first question is, how has, uh, Neha worked with the Flint, Michigan water issues from Roz Thompson. Oh, that's a great question. Thank you for asking. Um, so when it comes to water, we have, shortly after the Flint water crisis, we surveyed our members and what we found was that the, the our members named the six top environmental health concerns and infrastructure is was one of the top. And when it came to infrastructure, water was one of the top ones that came up over and over. Uh, and, um, and so the, the workforce knows that water infrastructure is an issue and that Flint um, 
in addition to being an env environmental injustice, also is an infrastructure challenge that not just a problem in Flint, but all across the US. Uh, there are so many cities with aging water supplies. So we've joined some collaboratives in this area um, to um, advocate towards and work towards um, lead service line replacement. So uh, these lead service lines that are in need of replacement that could currently be leaching um, toxins into our water supply. We've been working with a whole host of multiple other organizations as a part of a lead service line replacement collaborative um, to really help inform a path forward and, and drive forward recommendations. Great question. Thank you so much for asking. Excellent. We'll have time for just another question real fast. And also, if you could put up your contact information. If, if not, we can definitely get make sure everybody has that access to that. But the final question is, are, how are these viruses deadly to humans? Uh, like the mosquitoes, I think that's what they're referring to. Like the, how are mosquitoes the, harming humans? Absolutely. So I'm, I'm gonna pull up my contact information really quickly, bear with me for just a moment. Uh, thank you. So um, the mosquitoes can be har especially harmful to humans. It depends on what type of disease is being transmitted. Lyme disease is um, something that uh, for some people will last a lifetime uh, and affect quality of life that way. Um, and, and then there are some people that are more susceptible uh, to these different types of infectious diseases. As I said, we've got elderly, we've got children. Um, we don't want them to be exposed to lifetime diseases at such young ages. And then if they're already a bit susceptible, if they're immunocompromised, for example, uh, we, we really want to protect them from those types of conditions as well. So there may be genetic factors or biological factors that have um, folks more susceptible uh, given their circumstances. Um, and we really want to ensure that all are protected from vectors. So uh, similar to what I was saying about air pollution and school absences, when it comes to vectors, it's not just a nuisance, it's not just a bug bite. Um, we've got to protect our communities. So thank you also for, for that um, question as well. So again, thank you so much for uh, taking your time to talk to us today. So uh, we're going to pass it off to Ginny to introduce our next speaker. Hello, we hope you guys are enjoying the event so far. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Mr. John Riley. He is a product manager and engineer at Samtech. Um, Samtech is an engineering company that uh, specializes in connectors and cables, and it's actually headquartered uh, right nearby in New Albany. Um, they have over 6,000 employees in 40 international locations. John is also the founder of Maker 13 and the Maker Mobile Unit. Um, and so he walks the walk when it comes to sharing his STEM, inter STEM interests and inspiring local talent. Um, John, we are very excited to have you here today. Thank you for being here. Hey, good morning, everybody. So uh, hopefully you can hear me okay and uh, audio is good. All right. Well, thanks guys for, for allowing me to come. Um, I am physically at Maker 13 today uh, with a lot of the things going on. I don't get to go into Samtech as much as, I, as I'd like to. Um, so yeah, Samtech is where I, I spend my day to day. Um, and then Maker 13 is something that's for the community, something for you guys, um, something that uh, anybody from the community can access. So uh, what I'll do is I'll start, um, I've got a quick little presentation, and then I'm going to take you guys for a walk. I want to take you for a, a physical tour throughout the building, and then talk about how creativity, innovation um, can really help with not just um, finding a passion in, in your life, um, but it can help relieve some stress. It can help with, uh, you know, maybe some of the isolation stuff at home. Um, and so hopefully today kind of inspire you guys a little bit um, and, and get your, your minds thinking and, and wheels turning as far as um, maybe what can I do uh, if I'm at home um, or if, when I get to go to school or, or some of the other events. So I'll start sharing my screen and then we might jump around a little bit. So Maker 13, uh, again, it's a community workshop. Um, and 
this full screen here for you. Um, and we're just a community of creative uh, people, makers, and innovators. Uh, the Maker Mobile is our mobile outreach, which SamTech will sponsor and send out into the community along with other community organizations um, to go into schools, to go into the community, go to into fairs and things like that. So I, I, I like this picture that I found. Uh, there's a creative and like a, a, an analytic and logic side of everything. Um, and so some people say right brain, left brain. Um, and so in your head, it may feel like this sometimes. And some people are stronger oriented one way and some people are stronger oriented the other way. Um, but when you can tap into both sides and really start to think about things in a different way and to look at a problem in a different way, uh, you can come up with some really neat and innovative solutions. So this is what a brain could look like. This is probably what it feels like where you're at today. It's just there's so much going on. There's so much happening in the community. You don't have a lot of control over what's going on. And so sometimes it just feels blah. Uh, sometimes it's just uh, it, it's, uh, it's painful. Uh, sometimes it's hard to see what's going on in the world. Um, how can I make a difference? How can I voice what I feel? How can I, I uh, get through the day and, and just feel good about what's happening? So I don't want you to feel like this. I want you to feel like this. I want you to tap into both sides of, of what's happening. And uh, stuff that, that uh, Sam Tech's really passionate about, as well as Maker 13, and then what the Science Center is really passionate about, about STEAM, uh, STEM, uh, STEAM with the art, the science, technology, art, engineering, and math. Um, we want to bridge and tap into both of those sections. Uh, so I'll jump into just a little bit of history of, of uh, Maker 13, uh, and then I want to I want to take you on a, on a little tour. So uh, we've been around for about four or five years, uh, but we've been around longer with a mobile aspect out in the community. Uh, you know, we with people that come into the space, there are people that are learning new skills, starting new businesses and taking their art and being able to sell it or the crafts uh, to support them to make extra money and to do things on their own. Be a little bit more uh, self-sufficient. Um, don't wait for things to come your way. Go out and search them out and look for them. So we, we currently have about 85 members here that come and go um, and that are running all these small businesses. Uh, with a mobile lab, before we had to shut it down um, or just put it on hold for now, uh, we had seen almost uh, 500,000 people over the past seven years uh, driving that around to schools, uh, communities, uh, we, we took it to fairs, global fairs, and all over the place around the country. So this was the mobile lab that started all of it. Um, and part of this was really to get tools and get things in your hands to introduce you to some of these things that exist. Um, and this plays a big deal within SamTech is that we want people to be able to use equipment, whether it's for your own personal gain or if it's for employment or something down the road um, to kind of chart a new course for what you want to do. So take your passions, take your ideas, take your thoughts, apply them to some equipment and let the machines do some of the work for you so that you can express yourself and do things on your own. So this is, yeah, this is now parked for, for at least the next few months uh, until schools will open back up and, and allow us back in to visit. Um, but hopefully we'll be able to do some small community visits over the next uh, few months, uh, maybe just a little different. Um, but the idea is, is come on the trailer, hands-on stuff, and then walk away with something that you've built using the equipment. So using lasers, using 3D printers, and using CNC equipment. This is some of the, just wanted to show you some of the things. This was at uh, a couple of years ago at the VEX Robotics World Finals. Um, and so we actually got to drive it into the Kentucky Exposition Center uh, and set up and really engage with people, um, let them use equipment, let them, uh, you know, use that for some of their projects and some things that they were doing. Uh, this is just general setup. You see the, the CNC equipment, the 3D printers, the lasers. And the goal is to come through as a class and, and build things and use things that are in, in your mind um, and to physically build them out. So our goal here at Maker 13 and the Maker Mobile is to really inspire and enable your creativity and your imagination. 
And if we can do that by introducing you to an idea or introducing you to a, a piece of equipment that helps you express that idea, um, we want you to, to use that imagination, use that creativity, uh, and do amazing things uh, in your life. So just here's, here's where we are. We're literally right across the river. Um, I gave the walking directions just in case. You can also go across the Big Four Bridge and, and come visit. Um, but we're super excited to have people come in and just visit. Uh, students, we have different ways that we can engage with with projects. Um, our typical mode of operation is like a gym with a membership. And so I, I put those memberships up there, but uh, more for adults and, and people coming in after work. But for kids and project things, keep an eye out. Um, for activities that, that can be engaging. Um, and then we love working with a maker place at the Science Center uh, to do overlap engagement and, and different projects. So you've heard me say maker uh, uh, probably a dozen times. And so this is the really long answer to what a maker is. It's somebody who fits within a maker culture or subculture using technology and all this stuff. Um, but what a maker is, is just someone who wants to be creative someone who wants to make things. We don't care how you make them. We don't care what you use, what tools. It could be scissors and tape, um, or you could use the CNC laser or CNC router or 3D printer to, to express what you want. So what does this look like? How can I be creative? What can I do when everything, if you turn on the news, look around, there's just so much unrest there's so much chaos. There's so many uncertain things that are so out of our control. So I wanted to go for a little walk. Uh, so figure out how, how do I start being creative? Where do I find the inspiration? Who can help me? And, and why is this all important? W what can this help me, uh, you know, have some sort of relief, some sort of uh, express myself just a little bit? Uh, where, where I've got you right now is, is one of the 3D printers. And so this is a sculpture that was made. Uh, and so what it is doing is melting plastic into this sculpture. And so one way that if you wanted to be creative and kind of express what you're doing is you can take just Play-Doh, clay, something, and create a sculpture uh, to where that you, you can show that or share that. Now, not everything that you make has to be shared with people. This can literally be for your own personal use. Um, something that gives you joy and something that, that will make you happy. So um, whether it's a, a sculpture, we use the 3D printers for, for prototypes and startup presentation things um, to where small businesses can use that and create things. We had another one of the, uh, this is another sculpture that someone made um, that we were able to 3D print and make a smaller piece to it. Hey, John. So I do want to. Yes. Um, one second. We're going to try and pin your uh, phone screen because uh, the speaker view puts it back on your computer. So I think the gotcha. students can't see what you're doing. Okay. And I could. Uh, yeah, I don't almost know. carry around the yeah. computer. <laughs> Let yeah, me do that. Okay. All right. That sounds good. Yeah. All right. All right. That's great. You're doing okay? <laughs> All, right. All right. So here, I'm going to give you a little tour and hopefully I can show you a little bit more. Um, so that's the sculpture that I was talking about. So this sculpture has actually been printing for about 15 hours. So I started this yesterday afternoon. So 3D printing may not be the fastest thing, but it can definitely really do some really neat detail and some really cool stuff. I do want to walk you over. We did another project uh, just yesterday. Um, and so I want to show you different ways that people have come up to be creative. And so what I have is on the computer, we took a handwritten letter from a deceased family member. And we took that person's handwriting and used the lasers to actually put their handwriting on the part, which you really can't see very well. <laughs> it's all glass. Um, but finding different ways to share something that maybe came from the past, something that, that you wanted to share and express, um, that's one way to use the equipment. Now, I do have one of the lasers set up so that you guys can see. 
So I'm going to start it up and see if we can make this look. And so this is going to cut out letters that then you can use for different projects and activities. So we'll let that cut and we'll come back to that here a little bit later. But here at Maker 13, we have a whole collection of tools. And it's the same way that the Maker Place at the Science Center has tools and equipment and projects that you can come use um, to find out what's, you know, something that excites you, something that, that makes you uh, want to be more creative. So the goal here at the shop is just expose you to a lot of things, a lot of different tools that you might not have access to typically, and to see what that, that does. So here behind me on the back wall is a, is a CNC embroidery machine. And so if you ever wanted to put your logo or put your name on something, personalized things, that's great for that. Or if you wanted to use this giant quilter, you could create your own quilt. Something that's really cool is if uh, you save shirts from school, you save different things that you want to remember, uh, people will make quilts out of those things. Uh, and so you can use that with the equipment together and bring it all together. So I'll walk you around a little bit just to show you a little bit more what's here at the shop. Um, one of these little projects that we did with Samtech is we built this little light, uh, it's a Plinko board, but we wanted to show how electronics can be used, um, different ways to create projects, whether you're making a game, if you ever wanted to, to make a game design or a system, you could create your own pieces and learn how to solder. And so this is just a little project that we would take out and we can show different ways to create things and, and solder things. I'll take you back here. Um, now this is the wood shop. And so this is a little bit more, uh, a little bit larger equipment. Um, so back here we have different projects that we can work with and we'll do stage projects. Um, the big machine in the back is a CNC router. And so we've had people take their handwriting blow it up to full eight feet, and then you can see and see cut out your handwriting. If you look at our little project here, it's a little rocking horse where the machine cut out everything for us, and then we just put it together. So the machine did all the work, took 30 or 40 minutes, and then you could build your rocking horse in about 10 minutes. So I'll take you back out front. And again, the goal of here of the the uh, the maker mobile of maker 13 and even there at the maker place at the science center is to help engage and inspire you to find different ways to be creative and so one thing is well what if i can't get to one of these places what do i do uh really neat thing is and we'll see how far i can get out here is look around your environment look around where you are and so here at maker 13 we're located in Jeffersonville, but we're in the arts and cultural district. So if you have access to a park, to a public space, get outside, go look around. The water tower was a, a decommissioned water tank. And so they let a local artist spray paint that. So they came together and they hung off the side of the water tower and used their creativity to share that with the whole community. And so if you come across the 65 bridge coming north, you can see that and see all the things that are happening here in this arts and cultural area. So let me get back to share the screen. And I'll finish out some of this and kind of tie back some of the things I was talking to, um, but then I'll, I'll touch base and touch on some of them. So we went for the walk to get started. So where do you find inspiration is, is anywhere you are. And a lot of that, and sometimes, it, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's things that you want to, to voice. So if you're in an environment that seems kind of chaotic, you can use that for inspiration. Um, we were watching a, a little story. We were watching uh, some of the survivor things with like a Bear Grylls where they, he takes a celebrity out into the, the, the woods and they do an activity. They try to survive the night. And when we were watching that with my family, they said, gosh, a lot of these celebrities have really, uh, you know, interesting backstories where, you know, maybe they had a single fam single parent. Uh, maybe they grew up in, in a impoverished area. Uh, maybe they had a rough backstory. Um, but what that does is they're able to use that 
use lessons that they learned from that and express themselves in different ways. And that's why they are such good actors and actresses. Um, so use your environment, good or bad. You got to find what, what makes, uh, what builds your story and use that uh, to, to tell your story. So look around you, no matter where you are, no matter what you're doing, there's always places and points for inspiration. And this is something that's pretty important is how, how do you find help? And you're here, you, you, you know, the, the online content, the things that you guys are exposed to, uh, you can use that kind of as mentorship, uh, somebody that can, that can guide you, somebody that's doing things with you. Um, but then having these four people in your life uh, will help with you expressing your creativity and finding ways to, uh, to do really neat things. So a mentor, a coach, uh, you know, a coach may not always feel like they're the best, be your best friend, uh, but they're on the sidelines cheering you on um, and, and making sure that you can be that person that you need to be. Um, but then also you have a cheerleader who's just constantly rooting for you, wanting you to be positive and wanting to do great things. And then your friends, you know, having a really good friend who's there with you, no matter what the outcome is up and down. So if you can find these people, um, try to name them um, and then try to look for them, find somebody around you that can help. And it doesn't have to be your family. It could be somebody from school, somebody from the science center, somebody from a community event, community outreach group. Um, but look for help and look for people out there. And so why is creativity important? Why, is, uh, why does this help with uh, mental health, with where you are in the current situation, where the current environment is? Um, you know, I found one article from, from a, a college at Boise State. Um, you know, it, it, that's where I mentioned earlier, creativity doesn't have to be for anyone else but yourself. If it is literally just an outlet for you to express how you feel at the current moment, something that will make you happy, something that will make you grow. Um, that's a benefit for, uh, for being creative in helping with your mental health. And during these times of isolation where maybe you spend more time behind the screens than, than you really want to. Um, but it can also help with anxiety. Uh, there is uh, a lot of different studies. And then a lot of these, these articles and conversations that were written were written a couple of years ago. So it's not a current now time thing. Creativity can help you uh, grow and, and, and build from there. So um, it, it's a release. It helps you. So if you're frustrated, if you're, if you're having trouble trying to figure out what you want to do, um, start making something, drawing a picture, writing a story, creating something, crafting something. Um, and that will help kind of help alleviate some of that and help reduce some of the anxiety. So we already did a tour, so I'm going to bounce through some of the pictures. But these are some of the things. When we teach a class here, it's really a one-on-one -on -one thing. We, we, we want you to, to be there with a mentor and a coach um, to show you how to use the equipment and feel comfortable with it. Um, and then we want you to build things that are really neat. So these are just some of the things. We've looked around a lot of these different pieces of equipment. I'm going to put my contact information up here at the end. Uh, so that if you have questions or want to see anything, more than happy to answer any questions. Um, this is a quote that we have on the front of the trailer. And so I did want to circle back to this because if you feel like you're, uh, if you feel pe people think you're one of the crazy ones, you're one of the rebels, you're one of the troublemakers. Uh, this was uh, Steve Jobs used this in one of his uh, talks. Um, but as a maker, as a creator, People are always going to look at you funny. They're not going to make me understand what you're trying to convey. But as long as it makes you happy, uh, as long as you're being able to express yourself and feel comfortable with yourself, um, you know, that's where we see. That's where the makers, we see the genius. We see that, you know, where because everyone else thinks uh, crazy enough to change the world, um, those are the ones that do. So use your creativity, use your, uh, the tools that are at your disposal, seek out help and mentorship, um, and change the world. And you can do that whether you create a product or if you create art or you create whatever you, whatever you want. So I don't know if I left some time for, for questions. Uh, here's the contact information. Um, any of our staff can answer questions about, you know, different things that we have going on, uh, or if you don't know who to reach out to, to find ways or to find outlets, 
um, send us an email at the info at maker13.com and uh, we'll be happy to uh, answer anything or point you in the right direction. If we don't have the tools, we'll seek it out for you and we'll see if we can find you some help to, to help figure out how you can express some of that creativity. All right. Thank you so much, John. We really appreciate it. It was awesome to hear more about Maker 13. Um, I'll give students a minute to post any questions. Uh, I'll go ahead and get started with a question. Um, I was curious, what are some of the benefits for future STEM uh, professionals because of the maker movement and maker education? Have you seen that field kind of change? Yeah, and that's that's one thing that uh, when we do things with the trailer and do outreach kind of things, we like to show multiple paths to success in STEM fields. Um, and so don't think that you have to go to engineering school or get a four year degree for any of these things. If you know how to apply what's in your mind uh, and use equipment that's accessible, um, any of the companies around here will give you a, a good look uh, and talk to you because they want people that can express themselves and to make something tangible out of their thoughts. Um, and so you could do that with a, a trade school. Um, you could do that with a certificate from a community college. Um, or if you wanted to do more, if you wanted to, you could do the, the four-year degree kind of thing. Um, but just create kind of a portfolio. So think about saving some of your work, you know, using that as examples of how you can use tools and equipment. Um, and I know that these manufacturing companies, and again, that's one reason that Samtech was really excited about this was now people have proof of their work. You know, it's not just a paper that says you can do this. Here is something that I made. Awesome. Um, and another question. So you mentioned earlier um, that the memberships are more so for adults, um, but you mentioned that, you know, students should be on the lookout for stuff. What kind of stuff um, do you offer for students or how can they get involved in maker initiatives or activities? Sure. So a lot of the equipment in the front of the shop, uh, usually 16 years old and older, can use that equipment on their own. Um, some of the 3D printers and lasers and things that are closed systems with a parent or a guardian present, uh, 12 year old and up can use some of that. So just physically at the shop, uh, we, we need a parent present uh, when using things, um, but we can also do different engagements. So we do pop up classes um, when we get the trailer out in the community, that's, that's open to anyone to come and see. Uh, and then during some of the, um, the e-learning and school closures, um, we have seats available for anybody that doesn't have internet access. They can come and use the space as, as just a place to plug in and, and use the internet. Um, so at the bare bones, you know, if you need a place to go uh, and do some of your schoolwork, you can come hang out here. Uh, we just ask that you reserve a seat uh, and it's free, 100% free. Um, but then if you want to do some of the projects, just watch for that um, on all the social media platforms. It's uh, at Maker 13 Indiana. Uh, and we'll post things. Uh, but as we get the trailer out and we do some community events, um, again, look for those. They're, they're, they're always free. Uh, but if you want to come in and build things on the equipment, we just that's where the membership comes in. Great. Thank you. And then we have one question from Leslie. Um, he was or he or she was curious, um, does Maker or I'm not sure if they were thinking of you in particular as an engineer, um, what do you specialize in? So they brought up like welding as an example. Yeah, so we have, and that's what's neat about the maker. Uh, so the shop itself is exposure to all of it. So from welding to sheet metal, to fabrication, to woodworking, to textiles, uh, to soldering, to, to uh, 3D printing and modeling. Um, I tend to gravitate more towards the, the 3D modeling and the CNC equipment. Um, but I, I teach a lot of the classes. So you're going to get teamed up with somebody from the community. Um, we've got some machinists that have been machinists for over 40 years who will come in and teach you how to use some of the metalworking equipment. Our classes won't give you that certificate. It'll give you access to the equipment and an understanding is that something that I want to do. Um, and so that's where, uh, you know, you can kind of try things out and then we'll be happy to point you to where here's, here's how you get a certificate here's how you take this to the next step and we'll connect you with a network of, of makers and creators in the community. Awesome. Thank you so much, John. We appreciate it.
Yeah. All right. And I will pass it along. Um, I believe Melissa, are you next? All right. All right, John, thank you so much. Always a pleasure to see Maker 13 in action. Um, so as we are you know, moving along through our presentation, uh, I actually wanted to introduce our next presenter, Mr. Norman Seawright. Hello, how are you? I'm good, um, how are you doing? Norman, I'm going to just do a little brief intro. I hope I do you justice. Uh, Norman Seawright has an extensive flight and military career, starting with a degree in engineering from the University of Mississippi. Trained in strategic air command flying, Norman left the military and became a flight engineer on the DC-8 with UPS and is now the assistant chief pilot for Louisville Flight Operations. Norman, thank you so much for joining us. And again, reminding everybody, if you have questions throughout the uh, program, just feel free to submit those in the Q&A box. All right, Norman, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Good morning, everybody. I've, I've been listening to the other presenters and I, myself, I'm just, in awe at, at all their presentations and all the things that are happening, especially in the Louisville, in the Louisville area. So like Melissa said, I'm originally from Mississippi. I was born, raised, educated, and trained in Mississippi. I'm, I'm the fifth, fifth child and the firstborn son of eight children from my mother and father. And um, my father passed years ago and uh, I have six sisters and one brother who he passed a few years ago too. So um, I, I went to school in high school, I'm just gonna give you a little background. I, I was, I did everything that I could do. I, I didn't, I was never trying to be a one dimensional individual. So I was involved with a whole host of things from, from engineering, from to singing, to student government, to all the sports. I played football, basketball and track and letter in all three sports. So I, I just believed in just being busy. And I also very busy in my youth church department. Uh, so I. I, my mom and my dad, they just kept me busy and, and I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, I wind up going to school at the University of Mississippi, Ole Miss on a football scholarship. Uh, now people don't know this, but I turned down an appointment to the United States Naval Academy that was given to me by Congressman Trent Lott in Mississippi. And folk asked me, why did you do that? Well, it just didn't feel right. I, I, I applied for it and I really wanted to be um, a part of the military structure. But after I got the appointment, it, it, you know, how something just didn't feel right and it wasn't right for me and I didn't go. And I wound up getting a, a football scholarship to play at Ole Miss and I played there for th three years as a wide receiver. That's where I met my lovely wife. We've been married for 32 years. She still acts like she likes me. And uh, we have two great sons. So uh, it, it, it turned out really well for me being at Ole Miss. I got an engineering degree there. I uh, still played football. I still was involved in student government, still involved in music, um, and uh, wind up getting a scholarship in ROTC, ROTC, and then going through pilot training in Columbus Air Force Base in Mississippi. And after that, I went out to uh, Beale Air Force Base in California flying KC-135s. It was a great job. I went globally. Uh, around the world in refueling SR-71s, air, aerial refueling SR-71s. And uh, I've been to a lot of places uh, around the world, some that I can't talk about, but it was a lot of fun. And, and I, I've had a great time, I had a great time with the military and I wind up joining UPS in 1992. And uh, when I got here, I was an engineer on the DC-8 and wanted to be an engineer on the 727 and in the first officer on the Boeing 757 and 767. And I joined management in 2000 and became a Czech airman in the SIM. Uh, while I did a lot of other stuff, including uh, crew resource management facilitation. It was a great time. I, 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 this is a great company. And, and, and it's interesting, people will ask me, you know, why did I, why did you join UPS? Why UPS? And it's easy to say, you know, because of the security because it's, a, it's really a recession proof country, uh, company. But more than that, I, before I ever joined the company, I just really enjoyed the people. And, and this is crazy, I, I know, but when, when I was in the Air Force and I needed to ship a package, I would go to the UPS hub over, around uh, the little facility and I, and I hang out with them. It's, it's, it's 
I know it's weird, but that was just how I, I did. And, and I, I got to meet them and I really enjoyed people. You know, uh, people may not remember uh, what you said or what you did, but they, you, they'll, you, they'll always remember how you made them feel. And the, and the employees at UPS really made me feel very special. And, and, and it wasn't because they were trying to get my business. It's just, that's how they were. And so I really wanted to be, become a part of that. So UPS, one of the largest global companies in the world. Uh, our airline is, is, for the most part, one of the fourth largest airlines in the world. And it's, it's, we, really, we have about 269 airplanes uh, that stem from the uh, Boeing 757 to Boeing 767 the A300 by, Air, by Airbus, and then we have uh, Boeing 747-400s, and then the Boeing 747-8. And we're continuously growing. We're gonna get a lot of airplanes this year. And, and I'll tell you right now, um, when the recessions hit, UPS businesses increase. Uh, COVID-19 has caused uh, a, a, a tremendous shakeup in this country. Uh, but we could, I could tell you that because people are staying home, they're shipping more, which means, and they're ordering more things, which means that UPS is on the front line out there delivering your packages and trying to uh, make sure that we get them there on time. Sometimes we falter just because of the nature of business, but we definitely try to put our customers first. And, and, and that's one of the things I love about this company. I really am enjoy UPS. So I, I joined management in 2000. And uh, as I said before, and I became a Czech airman. Uh, and then I became a, an assistant chief pilot, and then wind up going into flight, uh, flight labor relations and doing some other stuff with Metro United Way campaign, and then uh, becoming a line Czech airman, which is just a little different. And then another assistant chief pilot again, specifically here in Louisville, Kentucky. And uh, it's been a it's been a a great ride. It's been a great run. Why cargo? Again, because it's pretty much recession proof job, job security, but I work with some incredible people. And uh, if you if you ever seen the UPS or you pretty much just kind of fall in love with them. And, and that's that's what I did when I came to this company. So um, how do you so I, I guess I can answer this question or ask this question to you. Um, for me, People ask me, well, how did you get into flying? Well, you know, when I was 11 years old, we lived near an airport. And I just used to look up and see airplanes flying all the time. And, and one day I said, man, I'd love to do that. And, you know, we didn't come from any kind of uh, extensive uh, discretionary uh, funds. <laughs> we didn't have nobody. But we had, I had a dream. And uh, my dad and mom made sure that we, we did our lesson. We got our lesson. I did well in school. I was fortunate enough uh, to get, I, I was offered some academic scholarships too at some other colleges, but I just wound up going to, to Ole Miss. And that was, a, that's a whole nother story that I'll give to you some other time. Uh, but I wound up going there and, and it was great. I got a degree from that, uh, from that school. And um, the interesting thing is I didn't even care that much about football. I know, but I was good enough to play and good enough to get a scholarship and uh, good enough to, to stay there and get a degree. And, and that was one of the great things that I love about the company I, I, and about the university that our coaches and staff were very poised on making sure that we were there, not, not only to play football or to play basketball or to, or to enter into the sports arena, but to make sure that we got our lesson. And, and I can tell you that uh, during the time that I was at the university, the, the graduating ratio of the athletes was was higher than that of the students. So we were really proud of that. And, and I can say that you, Ole Miss is a great school. Now, now, they might list it as a party school. And yes, they do party. But it was a great school for learning. And, and I had a great time there. Um, how do you get to this position? I, I have people ask me all the time, well, how do you become a pilot? I didn't know anything about flying when, when I was in uh, college and I wind up in my ROTC, I got an ROTC scholarship too while I was there and, and I wind up get, getting a pilot slot and there they gave me, I, I wind up getting about 29 hours of flight time in a Cessna 172 and from there I was 
given the opportunity to go to undergraduate pilot training in the United States Air Force. And that, from that point, you guys can hear me okay, right? Okay, good, good. From that point, find time to ask, right? So <laughs> from that point, when, when I, <clears throat> undergraduate pilot training, they, at that time, they were training us in the T-37, which is a, a Cessna product, twin engine, and the, the, we they call it a tweak because the engines were just really high-pitched and loud. And then uh, when, you, when you graduated from the T-37, we went to the T-38, which is, which is a Northrop Grumman uh, airplane, and it actually was supersonic. Uh, tandem seating, fun to fly, and uh, a lot of aero, aerobatic maneuvers in that. And that, that aircraft, uh, the F-5 was built on that same line and some of the uh, NATO forces used, still flies in the F-5 uh, aircraft, and the, and the F-20, I'm sorry, and the F-20. So, uh, so now the training is a little different, but it was military. And from that, when, once you graduate from undergraduate pilot training, you wind up getting an assignment. And my assignment was KC-135s, air refueling in Beale Air Force Base, California, because my buddy told me that's what he got. And I said, okay, I'm going out there with you. And I chose KC-135. And it's just, it's one of those things. Um, I never really thought that I would be leaving the Air Force after eight and a half years. Um, I, my goal was to make a career out of it, a 20 year career. And uh, I had I had a couple of buddies who said, man, you should be with here with us at American Airlines or at Delta Airlines or so forth. And I said, why the airlines? Because I was, I was very comfortable where I was with the Air Force. And I was telling someone the other day, it's kind of weird, you know, when you're at that time, you're, you're making, you know, $60,000 a year and you're on top of the world. And I got to UPS in my first year, I was making about $29,000 a year. It's like, oh my God. Uh, but the next year it was triple that. And I was like, oh, whoa. <laughs> so, but it just affords you not only a, 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 an opportunity to be able to pay your bills, feed your family, you can still contribute to community. And the company is really very much about that. And that's why I love this company so much because it, as you know, UPS is really involved in community everywhere we are. And, and uh, it's, it's what our, all of our CEOs, especially our, our new CEO, Ms. Tomei, is, is encouraging us to be a part of and encouraging us to do, and, and it's really great. So um, how do you do this? You know, uh, right now the military is, is really a great way and one of the quickest way to try to get into uh, a major airline. And uh, when, you, when you, you, you have to, it's a petition we can talk about it. It, it, it takes a little time. Uh, you have to qualify with an Air Force officer qualifying test and you have, at that time, I, I had to take a pilot's portion. They didn't have a name for it. I think the name now is BATS. Don't ask me what the acronym means. I don't know. I just found about, about it, uh, what B-A-T-S stands for. Uh, it's basic uh, something, tech. I, I, can't, I can't remember what, exactly what Jeff told me what it was, but anyway, you have, and it's an aptitude test more than anything else to see how you would be able to function in a certain environment based on sight, so forth, and, and, and your interpretation of what you're looking at, okay? That's pretty much how it gets started in the, in the military. And then from there, you'll, you'll be given the opportunity to go through pilot training. And, and we also have uh, what's now being considered one of the fastest growing uh, I want to say occupations in the military and in the world, I'm going to say is drone flying. And we actually have uh, uh, training for drones to drone fly. And it's, it's a little different, but hey, you sit at a desk, you fly, you, you fly a joystick and uh, you, 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 send, you send airplanes and drones certain places. And those things I can't get into either because I don't know. I'll just say it like that. I, I don't know. Those, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. I don't know. Okay. So <laughs> anyway, the other the other way is general aviation, and we find that at, UP, at UPS we are about 50, 50, maybe 60, 40 uh, uh, general aviation to to military or vice versa, um, 55 to 45 or so, and. <clears throat> Uh, general aviation is basically, you know, you going out to um, flight uh, flight standards or somewhere, and 
learning how to fly through a Cessna 172 or Piper Arrow or something like that, and you just start building time and building more and more time. It may take you a little longer to do that, uh, but it's well worth it because this is a great industry. Now, what about our pilots at UPS? How do they work? It, it's so funny. We were just looking at it the other day. Uh, there are 365 days in a year. Our pilots basically are, are scheduled to work half that time, which is about 183 days, right? So yeah, I know that's crazy. And, um, and so they're basically two months out of the year. Now, two months, two two weeks out of the month, I'll say it like that. Please forgive me. That was a little bit. Two weeks out of the month, they actually are are basically required to work. Well, <clears throat> and that gives them about seventy five hours minimum uh, of of uh, pay a month. And you know they they do pretty good. And a, and a lot of them will fly more than that. You know they'll pick up open time, or we'll we'll call them for junior. Manning or junior availability, just because we have so much volume that's going on right now. Excuse me, since the pandemic has hit, <laughs> someone's trying to call it. Since the pandemic has hit, in all honesty, we have had so much volume. We've been almost at peak levels uh, for, for a few months right now. And so we, we really are utilizing all 269 of these aircraft that we have and we're, we're, we're waiting to get more. So uh, I, I don't know how long I have talked. I really don't. Uh, but I, I, I'm, 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 uh, I'm very open to answer any questions and continue on. I, I do want to say that uh, this environment, uh, it can be frightening and it can be very rewarding. And if you, you have to, just like everything else, everything else you do, you really have to respect the airplanes, respect your training, respect the people that you're working with. Because, you know, when you, you're in a, an aluminum tube, you're flying with someone that you may have just met when you first showed up to fly. Well, you have to get along with them. And one of our primary tasks here at UPS, when we're hiring pilots, we look at personalities and we try to figure out within, you know, an hour or so, if you'll be able to work with the people that we have here. We've been very good, and I have to give our HR department a lot of credit. They've been very good at hiring some very great people. Uh, people ask me, you know, well, what do you do at UPS? And, and I say, well, I, I manage situations, I lead people, and every now and then I go fly an airplane. And the first, the next thing out of their mouth is, oh, you're, the, you're a pilot. I was like, okay, well, is that what you want to say? Fine, I'm a pilot. but. We want great employees. And, and in any company that you go to, they want great employees. And what does that simply mean? Um, uh, they want you to be on board. Every company wants you to be on board with what their, whatever their mission is. And, and sometimes you might not agree with it, and that's okay. Voice your opinion. And then they say, yeah, we, we thought about that. We understand it. They may have had some other insight that you may not be privy to. And, and once they say, yeah, but let's just go with it. Okay, go with it. I'll smartly step in line and do it. That's how the military was. That's how it is here at UPS. And I'm sure that's how it is at many other corporate organizations. So I would encourage you, you know, to take, take the opportunity to explore. And I, I tell people, especially young, young people like yourselves, never let anybody's negative opinion of you become your reality. Always look for something that you can do. And there's always something that you can do. And, and here's the thing, you know, I, I talk about passion <clears throat> and, and one of the things that I, I, I really mentioned, I, I talk about a connoisseur in the art of living. And I read this one day, I was 16 years old and I was as a, working as a kind of an intern for Chevron Oil in Mississippi. And I, being nosy like I am, I was walking around the, uh, the plant and I came upon this boardroom and in the boardroom written on the table, I'm sorry, written on the, like a chalkboard, was the, were these words. A connoisseur in the art of living knows no distinction between his work and his play. To some, it seems like he's working when he's playing. To others, it seems like he's playing when he's working. To him, he always seemed to be doing both. And to me, 
that's how I always, I've always tried to live my life. I, I want my work to be my play, my play to be my work. I, I, don't, I, I want the lines between them to be so blurred that it just seems like I'm doing both at the same time. And that's passion. And here's one thing about passion. If you are in your passion, if you're passionate about what you're doing, you will never work a day in your life, ever. Every time you come to work, it's a joy to be there. It's a joy to be around the people that you're with. And it's a joy to be doing what you're doing. So I, I would just tell you, you, you find your passion and you'll never, ever work a day in your life. So uh, I think I've covered almost enough. I, I'm here at work right now and I'm the duty, I'm, I'm the duty uh, assistant chief pilot right now. So I told my boss, I said, hey, I got to do a presentation so he can handle it for me. So if you, if you have any questions, I am completely open to them. Uh, Melissa, is that... Is it doing okay so far? Yeah, just a reminder, guys. If, again, if you have any questions, feel free to type them in the Q&A box and I can read them aloud. Um, let's see, I do have a few questions that um, we could look into. So let me ask you this, you know, when you talk about that passion, there are times when you have the passion and you have the goals, but what happens, you know, how can you explain if you hit roadblocks throughout your life, especially as a teen, you know, and you feel like either you don't have the resources, whether it's financial or support systems, or even the confidence, you know, what are some ways you can overcome those roadblocks that you may encounter as you're pursuing that passion? You know, I, I've always, uh, that's a very good question. I, I didn't come from money. I, I didn't come from a very wealthy environment, but I always had people who were uh, in my corner. And, and I wasn't afraid to tell people about what I wanted to do. I wasn't looking for a handout. I just wanted to people to know that, listen, I, listen I'm trying. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do the very best I can. And, and there are, uh, nowadays, there are scholarships that are available. There are opportunities out there. And it's nothing like, obviously, hard work. Now, I'm saying this because I, I have a few mentees and they're in that same boat. And whenever I can, I mean, and I, financially, I try to help them. But more than that, I give them the encouragement to go out and, and do. One of my mentees is, is a young 20-year-old young lady who decided that she was going to go to one of these flight schools. She took out a big loan, and she's getting her ratings. But at the same time, she's also working, you know, Pizza Hut or some other place like that. And so that she can get her ratings, and and it, it's it's her passion, it's what she she wants to do. So, roadblocks they're gonna be there. I had them, um, but there's someone who who will be willing to help you if you just don't mind sharing uh, what kind of uh, problems you might be facing. Is that is that pretty good an answer for yeah. you? No, absolutely. Um, let's see. What about you know when you talk about that idea of mentorship? What would you recommend for teens that are looking for those possible mentors in their life? Great, great question. Uh, <laughs> so I'm with quite a few organizations. One of them is the Organization of Black Aerospace Professionals, and then also with Flight Club 502. And the Flight Club 502 is for those individuals who are you know, coming up to their senior year in high school or so forth. And there, there are a couple of folks that are that might be just graduating from high school that are part of it. And there are, there are several UPS uh, pilots, local pilots, uh, pilots from other airlines that are part of the, the adult uh, sponsorship. But the students actually run this flight club and it's here at Bowman Field here in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, ask, you know, we, we uh, if you don't ask, you don't know. And, and I get calls all the time. It's very interesting. Um, I don't know how I wind up with like 11 mentees, but they just kept coming and people kept sending them to me. And I was like, okay. And, and the great thing about pilots, they're not going to turn you down, you know, because all of us realize and, 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 and remember how tough the struggle was, regardless of whether you're military or whether you were going through general aviation. It wasn't easy. It's, it's, it's never really easy. And, and uh, it, I, I tell people, it seemed like, you know, it's, it's a great 
You know, when you when you get to this level, you've kind of almost made it, but it's still not. Do you know I'm, I'm studying now because every year we I still have to go through annual training. So it, it never stops. And and I respect the airplanes when I get in them. I, I, I make sure that, that they're airworthy. I know the mechanic that I speak with makes sure that that that, that the airplane is airworthy. Uh, and, and I'll just have to tell you, I pray a lot. <laughs> and I, I don't I don't mind telling you that. I, I honestly, uh, I, I want to make sure, and I just believe in prayer, that's just me, but I, I pray uh, for the safety of my crew and for the safety um, of those who, who are gonna be on the ground if I take off or if something should happen. So it, it's, uh, it's an environment that demands respect. And so um, when you talk about mentorship, I promise you there will be, there will be very few pilots, very few people who will turn you down and say, I can't help you if you go and ask them, how do I become a pilot? I wanna become a pilot. And, and, and it doesn't matter who you are, where you are. And it doesn't matter where you are when you ask that question and you're going back, back someplace else. Cause I, I wind up getting a, a mentee from a guy uh, who was in Washington state and the guy found me because I finally asked, I said, how, how did you, how did we hook up? Because all of a sudden I'm mentoring this young man and I don't even know him. And, and, and I'm taking him places. And I said, you know, how did we connect? And he told me that he had gotten, that, gotten my information from some other people and it just happened. So that way I, I would encourage you to just be transparent and ask the question. We have two questions. One, can you talk very quickly about the uh, diversity of pilots in UPS? So specifically, you know, we want students to see themselves in these careers. What's the uh, the number of female pilots that you have in this area? Oh my goodness, Whew. Uh, we have a <laughs> we have a lot of female. I, I think at at one point, uh, I know we had uh, over two hundred. Uh, female pilots, and um, quite a few of them are retiring now, and and we're we're getting more. And, and I'm really I'm really proud to say too that uh, from an African American point of view, we actually have um, five African American female pilots, and we just just hired one recently. So that that's that's pretty impressive. And and I and I know them all. They're so funny because, well. A lot of people stop by my desk. I'll just put it like that. And and I and I and I've known I've known these pilots for a long time, and they're very very great at what they do. And many of them do some of the same things that we're doing now. They're they're, they're more than just an aviator. They're, they're presenters. They're 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 moms. They're friends. They're organizers. They're uh, actually uh, company owners. And so they're doing a lot of things, and it's great. So the diversity. It's, it's there. We are trying to uh, make sure that, that we actually reflect um, the, the, the amount of diversity that the company has in our, in our airline, too. And we're working at that. Fantastic. All right. Last question. White, she wants to know if you've ever flown out of the country. Of course. <laughs> I, I have. I, I've flown out of the country quite a few times. Uh, with uh, with the military to begin with, which is, and I have to tell you this, so this is just me, which is why I I felt I needed to get married, and it's weird because I was sitting in Japan, on a a concrete stump, and, and I'm I'm looking down the streets of Okinawa, and I'm seeing the festivities because it, it's it was near um, Christmas, and I was thinking, man, this is beautiful, this is wonderful. I mean, the, all the beautiful lights and the colors. And I say, wow, and I don't have anybody to share it with. So, so I, you know, I, I, and I've gone to a lot of different places and with UPS, I've gone through to a lot of different countries outside, uh, over in Asia, uh, in China, in Japan. Uh, I haven't gone to Australia yet. So, because my, the, the airplane that I'm on, I'm a Boeing 757-767 pilot and instructor, and we, my my fleet does not fly into Australia yet. We've gone to Hawaii, we've gone over, not as, even though it's still U.S., gone over to Germany, 
I've been to uh, Zurich and I've been to uh, Frankfurt. I've been over to India. Ooh, a lot of places. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Norman. This has been fantastic. Um, we are going to, uh, I'll look at the other questions and see if anything else has come up and I will be able to connect with Norman and I can always respond back later with any answers to those questions. We're gonna go ahead and turn it over to Andrew. who's gonna introduce our Youth Infusion Board. Thank you, Norman, have a great day. Thanks, you too. Thanks, Melissa, and thanks, Norman. That was a fantastic segment. We are going to conclude the Youth Science Summit with a video from our friends at SPOG at UofL. But first, I wanna have a quick conversation with some members of our Youth Infusion Board. So our Youth Infusion Board is a team of about 20 teens, middle and high school students that sign on for one year terms here at the Kentucky Science Center. And we ask them to contribute towards um, just providing their, their perspective to recruit their peers and to just support through volunteer service our, our different programs. So I'm going to uh, quickly introduce each of our team panelists and they can unmute their microphones in turn. So Simi Bala is our 2020 Youth Infusion Board President and is a senior at Manual. Allison Portero is our 2020 Youth Infusion Board Secretary and is a senior at Sacred Heart. And Jace Tyla is a sophomore at St. X. So thank you guys for joining us. Let's jump right into this, okay? And we'll start with Simi. Uh, with everything that's happened on account of the pandemic, um, have you made any adjustments to your long-term plans? I have not made any changes to my long-term plan since I'm still applying to college this year and I'm planning on attending next year. Fantastic. Allison, what about you? Right. I'm kind of in the same space that Simi is with all the um, changes. There's been a lot of questions, but I definitely am still planning to apply to college and attend next year. That's awesome. So I guess with all the conversations going on about you know, deferring college admission, taking gap years, sort of this renewed debate over the value of college education. It's really optimistic to hear that you guys are planning on just moving forward with your with your interests and in your uh, education and your STEM career. Uh, Jace, let me ask you, what about now? So you're a sophomore. So what was the end of your freshman year like and, and how are things now? Um, my end of the year, my freshman year was weird. Um, I was not able to meet most of my friends or uh, my teachers. So my school last year at the end of the year was fully online. Uh, the schedule was hectic and confusing. My teachers used all different types of platforms, which was really hard to turn in assignments and materials. Um, also the testing schedule in general, where normally teachers would have set dates where they were allowed to give tests. But over the last couple of weeks, they didn't exactly have one. so. Let's say, for example, on a Friday, most teachers would have all seven tests would be on one day. So it was really hectic and scheduled. So yeah. Where, where are you as a sophomore with regards to like standardized tests, test prep? Well, for test prep, I have not really started much. I have really just looked into the test though, the different types of sections, uh, the four different types of sections and like practicing individual ones and mainly just taking practice tests. But I've heard, it seems weird, but I've heard that some schools, maybe Allison, you can comment on this. Some of the schools are not requiring standardized test scores nowadays. Right, so a lot of schools, um, college, different colleges and universities have gone test optional. But for me and for like, I would say any other high school seniors or juniors on here, you really had to look into your um, individual schools that you're looking at because the rules differ for each. Um, and for example, a lot of schools have gone test optional for admissions but some have gone test optional for merit scholarships and honors programs while others haven't. And some even just lower the score instead of get rid of it altogether. Allison, you said uh, some have lowered their scores. Why is that? Well, I would say like in my personal opinion, I think it's because how difficult it's been for a lot of high school juniors and seniors to get in to take an ACT or SAT. Because like, for example, I was canceled about three or four times over the summer and a lot of my friends experienced the same, so during that time, my only official score, and I was lucky enough to have one, was from my sophomore year, which in my opinion, I would say doesn't really reflect the education I have now versus then. Well, we have, well, we have a lot of middle school and high schoolers in attendance at the summit today. 
So, I mean, can you tell us a little bit about Common App, what that is and what changes they've made? Yeah, so the Common App is basically the main application that much of the seniors this year will probably be using. Um, it's an online application that allows you to talk about your extracurriculars and your awards. Um, you can report your classes and your grades with your transcript. Um, you can write essays for any of the colleges you want to apply to. Um, and this year, the Common App has added um, a new section for an essay where you can write up to, I think it's 650 words on how the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted you. Um, you can really talk about this in any way you want. Um, so how the pandemic has impacted your mental health, how it's affected your access to resources and the impact that that has had, and even how it's changed um, your plans for the future. Um, it's really an open-ended question that um, you can elaborate on whatever you want the admissions officers to hear. Cool. Uh, let me ask you guys as a group how you've been staying busy. And before you answer, I should say, here at the Science Center, we uh, unfortunately had to cancel our in-person summer volunteer season, uh, but we are looking to uh, hopefully renew that for the summer of 2021 and stay tuned to our websites. As soon as we can offer teen volunteers online, we will be sure to 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 spread the word and 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 post that on our website. But uh, uh, let me let me ask you guys how you've been how you've been staying busy. Sammy, why don't you go ahead and start? I've basically just kind of other than like doing my schoolwork, um, I've been trying to I guess stay more active, and I've tried to been finding like any online volunteering opportunities. So I've kind of taken up on tutoring recently. Allison. So yeah. Um, also, I've been trying to find some volunteer service opportunities that are more social distance. So uh, one I like is with the Kentucky Humane Society. I've been making different items for them, dropping them off. So don't have to, I don't have to come in contact with anyone, but also just becoming more active and involved in community discussion. Like, you know, having Zoom calls with people, reading books, watching videos, and kind of, you know, focusing on that community education aspect. You know what, that brings up a really interesting point that as, a, as the, the Youth Infusion Board discussed, um, one of the things we really can't promote or encourage right now is any sort of volunteering at a hospital. Usually that is wonderful uh, volunteer work to put on a college application, but uh, it'd be very tone deaf to try to approach a hospital during the pandemic and try to shadow or job shadow or participate in person. But there are a lot of options available online. So I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, let's wrap up quickly, uh, but I just wanna ask one big question for each of you. Uh, I am curious how the um, current situation has affected your internal drive. So let's go ahead and we'll just answer this question in turn in sort of the order you were introduced. So Simi, go ahead. Yeah, so before the pandemic, I essentially had access to so many resources, whether that was like teachers in school, um, friends to just talk to, or even like test prep books for any standardized testing. Um, whatever I needed, it was in really access for me to get it. Um, now, a lot of those things have kind of been like stripped away, um, which not only made me like immensely grateful that they were even there to begin with, but also it motivates me a lot more to work towards my personal goals. Um, it's definitely been kind of hard to figure out how to do a bunch of it on my own, but um, in the end, it's only made me work harder for what I want. Fantastic. Allison? My, before the pandemic, I've always been a people person. I really, most of my activities and passions lie around how I can interact with other people. And so of course the pandemic and quarantine really affected that. But I think from it, I've just learned how to be a better communicator with the technology we have. So like the Zoom call right here, I've been on so many of these all the time and just figuring out ways to be involved in projects with people, even with the current restrictions and barriers that we sometimes face. And Jace, what about you? Uh, for me, my internal drive has really stayed the same since I'm still a sophomore in high school, so, don't, so I don't really have to worry about college just yet. Um, but for high school experience, I'm an NTI student, which means I really stay at home for seven days a week. Uh, uh, I really just talk over the phone with students or just talk, talk, talk like these for teachers and classes. What really is hard, though, is when I have a question or a statement asked to a teacher, I have to like uh, wait or schedule a meeting instead of when normally before the pandemic, I could just go to the teacher right after the school and ask my question and that'd be over. So it takes more time to really do everything. That's true. 
Well, that's, that's unfortunate, but Jace, don't sell yourself short because I also know, and I'll tell everybody here that I know you do fundraising for Norton's Children's Hospital. So that's, that's very cool and that's very admirable. So guys, I appreciate it. I thank you for taking the time to, to jump on and, and answer a few questions for the uh, Virtual Youth Science Summit. We are right at 11 o'clock and our um, official in time for this event, but we would like to conclude with a, a short video from our good friends at SPOG. That is the Science Policy and Outreach Group at UofL. Uh, they are a public facing organization with three main goals. They want to educate the community about science research and careers. They wanna expose students to science related careers and research at a younger age. And they want to create a dialogue with members of Congress in order to promote science-based policy and STEM education. So these are postgraduate students that are still relatively early in their STEM careers. So we hope that gives you a lot to think about. Um, again, this is gonna go past our 11 o'clock wrap up time. On behalf of everyone at the Kentucky Science Center, on behalf of all of our presenters today, and on behalf of our sponsors at Lexmark, ADP, and Toyota, we thank you so much for participating. And Rachel, whenever you're ready, let's play that video and you guys have a wonderful rest of your day. Hey guys. Hello. Hi guys. Hi everyone. Hello. I'm really, really happy to have this opportunity to talk to you all. I am Sanaya Stokey. My name is Amanda Brady. I'm Claire Westcott. My name is Rachel Flores. My name is Jennifer. My name is Ingrid Aconza. And I am a third year graduate student at the mm -hmm. University of Louisville. Mm -hmm. I am mm -hmm. a fourth year in the microbiology and immunology department. And I'm a student at U of L in the translational neuroscience department. I am a PhD student at the University of Louisville. I am a postdoctoral associate at the University of Louisville. And I'm here to tell you about my love for science. I am in the School of Medicine in the Department of Pharmacology and Toxicology. Anatomical Sciences and Neurobiology. I am studying Yersinia pestis, which is also known as the plague or the Black Death. I study alpha viruses. And I'm here to tell you a little bit about my path in becoming a scientist. So what sparked my interest in science? Um, as long as I can remember, I've always wanted to be a medical doctor. Um, it started from like when I was in kindergarten and it wasn't until I was in college and I was a junior and I was in a research lab that studied um, pathogens that infected cystic fibrosis patients that I really fell in love with research. And that's when I decided that I wanted to be a researcher. I remember in middle school, the day we did cheek swabs and analyzed our samples underneath the microscope. It was a pretty simple experiment, but it was really fascinating. So the teachers would come with seeds, plant them in small pots, and place them on the window frame, and the plant will, will grow towards where the sunlight is. And that's, that's my first memory of engineering science that I remember. I think started fifth grade, I was obsessed with Dexter's lab, and I begged my parents to get me a lab kit. I wanted to be like Dexter. I wanted to be experimenting all the time. And they did, and I spent hours just following the kit, making things up. And in seventh grade, um, my teacher told me, hey, Ingrid, do you want to be a part of science fair? And I'm like, yeah, I want to do it. And I created my own lip gloss. My interest in science began when I was in elementary school and middle school. I was really fascinated with scientific exploration and I was really interested in ocean science and I watched a lot of videos of a lot of television movies and documentaries about how the world works and how our bodies work and that fueled my curiosity and my interest to want to be a scientist when I grew up. I was about uh, in my fifth or sixth grade in the science class and we're in our, in our laboratory at school. Everybody was given these two types of six one is the metal ring and another one is the metal ball on top. Uh, and in the class, we're taught about thermal expansion. It's when you, uh, for example, metal, when you heat them up, they expand, they become bigger in size. And that's what people have to be mindful when they build something outside that involves metal. In the summer, when it's hot, it, it might change the shape of the structure. And so at first, this metal ball could pass through that metal ring, no problem, and it will heat them up 
on the fire under the safety of course and then suddenly once they became hot that ball could no longer fit through that ring anymore is it something really basic it was like really awesome for me probably was when i was about 12 i was in the state science fair uh and one of the university professors or he wrote on when he was kind of grading and he said novel and i'm like novel original so he thought i had original thought back then original thought in science and i was like Really good about myself. My first memory of enjoying science was when I was an undergrad and I had a zoology major and the first time I dissected an earthworm and I saw the inner workings of this earthworm and what its you know entire system looked like and it was fascinating to me. Who in your life as a mentor teacher shaped your careers and goals? Um, so I was in a research lab starting my junior year of college and my second senior year, I worked in a different research lab. I worked in both at the same time. It was really then that I got, got introduced to two different types of mentorship and leadership. It really made a difference in my life when someone was excited about me as a scientist and wanted to pull me into this world of science. That really shaped my career at that point that I wanted to be a research scientist because um, someone else kind of, you know, showed me their love for science. And I decided that then I wanted to share the science world with everyone else too. That's super, super important. You can just have one person who believes in you and sees whatever they see a light or whatever they see in you, just one, that's all you need. I, I love music. The career I was going to do would be a lawyer. I worked as a graphic designer. I wanted to be a dancer. I wanted to be a vet. And I tried to get into vet school in India, and I did not. I am very glad that I didn't because it sent me down this path of um, getting a major in zoology. And then I got here to the United States to do my PhD. Um, and the motivation was for, for that was just my love for science and for learning new things. That has always been my motivating factor. I've always enjoyed science. Science classes were always my favorite. I came from a super rural area, so we didn't really have great classes. Uh, or like, a, like super in-depth, and we didn't have a lot of money to spend on items. And so it wasn't really until I got to college when I fell in love with science and I fell in love with research. You know, I've always enjoyed um, being active, like volunteering my time through the Girl Scouts. And so I think that's really like shaped where I am now is that um, I use my time to talk about science to other people and share it with people to make sure that science is open to everybody. My scientific interest just kept coming through. It kept calling to me. And so I went to school again to college for a second time to focus on science. I grew up in Taiwan and in my time there was a stigma like you know science is kind of more for boys so I was under an environment kind of pushed me to the track that doing more non-science related stuff and I had some regrets because I feel like I could have done this earlier I should have followed my heart my feeling when I was in uh, my middle and high school. I think what made me love science so much was I'm someone that asks a lot of questions, so I was I always want to know why, you know. So I always think of a theory, okay, why this happened, and then I have to back it up. I'm not someone that you can just tell me something. I have to research it myself, and science kind of makes you do that. It makes you ask questions and then look for solutions and find how to solve that. And that was really my passion, and it really helped me navigate into a career. I ended up here because um, I loved science. So if you are a middle or high school student right now, I would like to tell you a few things. First, uh, try to discover your interest early on. I know not everybody can know what exactly they would like to do for their life uh, in this age but you know if you have any feeling right now you're just not certain or ask different people in those field of your interest questions hopefully you'll find something 
that is really matching your your heart, your feeling, your interest. Science is also a big field. What in the science do you like? Do you like more biology? You like more neuroscience, or you like physics, engineering, all kind of science, even medical. So, what is your true interest? Try to focus whenever you can and whenever you know you need to. I know you have the ability of critical thinking, and I wish you find what you truly like. I'll say, baby girl, you got this. You know, keep grinding, keep moving. Like this hard work will pay off. There's gonna be people that will deter you. There'll be people that try to like put you down, but stay grinding and believe in yourself. You have to believe in yourself. Just don't be afraid of anything. Like the sky is the limit. Surround yourself with people who make you feel good. It's not really you know science based, but it has everything to do with your career. If you surround yourself with people who make you feel good about yourself, then you're gonna do well in classes. Job. If you like who you are as a human, you're going to like what you put out there. What I would say is don't don't let romance be too distracting. Um, it's nice and it's important, but that should be the salad dressing on the salad of life, not the salad itself. Take that extra science class. Participate in that club. Do a science fair project. I would tell myself to stop focusing on the type of career that I wanted and. Think more about the stuff, the parts of that career that I enjoy the most. If I would have done that, I would have found my way to microbiology a lot sooner. I would say that the most important thing is that you pursue your interests, follow your curiosity and your passion. Science is not hard. It's not what people tell you out there. It's not for the smart people. It's for the curious people. So if you are curious, that should be what, you know, fuels you to do science. It kind of actually has to do with um, the pandemic as a whole. When you're a virologist and you study these viruses, you learn about past history and, you know, like the Spanish influenza, the swine flu, and you learn about those. And you never think that you're actually going to experience a pandemic in your life. Um, so it, it is incredibly interesting to learn about a pandemic and a virus in real time and having all these scientists scramble and try to do their best research in a short amount of time. I really don't know what's the most interesting thing I've learned in my career. I think everything I've learned so far has been really interesting. I find everything interesting. So I can tell you one thing that's, that's interesting. For example, I mean, when I go to different Departments and look at posters on the wall. You know, I look at chemistry posters. I'm like, this is so interesting. I should have been a chemist, but I still feel like I wouldn't trade it for neuroscience. I still love where I am. Most interesting thing in my field would have to be the brain bone, which is where you take uh, fluorescent properties of jellyfish and put them inside cells so you can see what they do. Rad, and you can do all different colors. So cool. So I look at how cancer is actually started. Because wildlife and humans share the same natural environment, we're exposed to the same pollution. And we can study how different species respond to environmental uh, pollution exposures differently. And that can give us insight into how cancer is caused and maybe how we can prevent cancer. Whales, for example, would be predicted to have high rates of cancer because there's toxicants in the ocean, there's toxicants in the air that whales breathe as well. However, when we treat whale cells and human cells with the same toxicants, the human cells turn cancerous, whereas the whale cells don't. So there is some way that um, whales may have become resistant to getting cancer. And if we look at what is happening at an intercellular level and molecular level and identify what are the differences between species, we can get more insight about the nature of how cancer is caused. There's a whole world around us tiny, tiny little microorganisms, and they have such power. If you eat something that has bacteria on it, you can become really, really sick. 
How is it that something so small can pack such a punch? So this is a question here. What do I enjoy the most about what I'm doing right now? Do you mean science-wise? Are you joking? Of course, I enjoy everything. I don't really know what I enjoy the most. Doing that is fun. Just like a lot of things we face in our life. Sometimes we come uh, into struggle, we come into problem. Doesn't mean we should let those challenges overshadow the good part, the fun part. And a lot of times we have a question, we try to think about how to approach, solve this question, solve this problem, we design experiments. And our experiments don't always work. And sometimes that could be frustrating, you know, all this process, sometimes challenging, but could be really enjoyable. What I enjoy about what I'm doing right now is the fact that gives me opportunity to learn new things almost every day. I feel like what I'm doing right now helps me learn a lot. There's a lot to learn. You're a good scientist if you ask lots of questions. Asking questions. Sincerity. Ethical. Tells the truth always. Hard work. Caring. And very curious. It's a curious person. A lot of people think that intelligence is the major factor. It's really who asks questions. There is no dumb questions when it comes to science. Being curious and want, wanting to answer a question. If you care about the environment as well. I think your curiosity and your creativity is really important as a scientist. There are so many different angles to science. 